So I'm really thankful to whoever decided to make the living room look nice and place the pillows here. <laughs> but I do want to apologize in advance because in my subculture, um, an Arab American, we do not give our backs to people. So in advance, I'd like to apologize for giving you my back, but I'm probably going to turn and look at you anyway. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Salaam alaikum, peace and blessings of God be with you, and a big thank you for everyone who's put their heart and soul into, into um, organizing this, and for the skies for hosting us and bringing us together if we flew here in the roads, for um, driving us here together, and I think sometimes we don't think about those moments that somebody constructed those roads and that God built that sky, and that those are highways for us, both spiritual and physical. So I'm to talk to you about Zaman International, but I don't think I can only talk to you about that. Um, Zaman actually means time. It's a very lofty Hebrew and Arabic word. It was inspired um, back in 2004 when my life was a little bit crazy and I needed to kind of put all of the humanitarian work that I was doing and all the energy under one umbrella so that I could survive and take care of my sister with cancer and my father who was suffering from frontal lobe dementia. And when I went to the lawyers, I was calling it Salam International, which means peace because it was post 9-11 and I thought, well, you know, hijab, um, it would be good uh, to have something that people would see as peace. And, um, you know, I used to say in these early lectures, see my smile, not my scarf. Let's think about what's in my head, and let's talk about that, not what's on my head. And I always wanted to go around doing this. I thought, okay, let's do Salam International. And I felt this inspiration. Whether you call that feminine, feminine wisdom or whether we call it inspiration, whatever it is, as a nurse, we know that we have this sixth sense <laughs> And in that sixth sense, there's a voice that happens to you. And it comes sometimes from training. It's an intuition. And I kept hearing Zaman International. And so, the, so Zaman was created. And I will spend just a minute or two talking to you about Zaman because Zaman's stories are quite um, tearful. And they really tug at the heartstrings. And they're stories that never really quite leave you. But with the clock ticking down at 9.35, I can't do it justice. But I will tell you that Zaman started because of an infant baby that was dying. And I negotiated a deal with the hospital so that the family would not have to remove the baby from a ventilator. And it was a refugee family who had already suffered tremendous loss and then immigrated to the United States and felt a tremendous amount of distrust of the healthcare system and so on and so forth. And I just wanted them to be able to live knowing that they had not pulled the baby off of the ventilator. And miraculously, hospice took the baby, we took the baby home. And when I went to visit this extremely poverty-stricken family, and I grew up in poverty, I kind of grew up in the immigrant ghetto is what they would call us, but never knew we were poor, they brought me the baby in a laundry basket, a white laundry basket with new towels, and the baby just lied there, and, um, and they had no stove, and they had no refrigerator. They had a carpet like this, and while I'm sitting here, I'm also being present and listening, but I was reflecting about the carpet and how that was the only thing that was in the house, and the dignity that the family had was so profound and so beautiful, so dignified. So, of course, I left the front porch and had my white coat on and my stethoscope, that position of authority and power, and I called my mom, cried my eyes out. I was teasing last night. She's like the big fat Greek wedding mom. And you know, we had plastic on our furniture and we used to Windex it every Saturday, that's very true. <laughs> and never stepped on the carpet lines and did all those kinds of traditional things. My mom gave me practically the whole entire house because she was switching it all out anyway. From that story, a U-Haul, my four children, myself, and then a whole bunch of youth, we began to do this refugee resettlement work. And so we had a program that was named after one of my patients who was dying, and I wanted to leave him a legacy. And so that became a refugee resettlement program. And then fast forward a couple years later, believe it or not, I happened to sadly find over 220 infants and fetuses that had not been buried, and this was 2002, and that was from 1995. 
So we created another program called Plots for Tots. And you know, life was busy and I was working and you know, all those kinds of things and doing a lot of the interfaith work. So the question is how and why and what was the inspiration? So I am Muslim by birth, but I am Muslim by choice. My family, I am privileged, honored to be raised by a mother and a father who deeply love each other, who were willing to have the courage to break some of the barriers that they were dealing with in their time, kind of the West Side story. Um, she was Sunni from Syria, but born in America. And he was Shia from Lebanon, born in America. My family's been here 126 years. And so I'm a sushi. And, um, and I was, we were the family that did everything. We had Christmas trees and Ramadan and Thanksgiving and all of the beautiful things and traditions. My mom wasn't afraid of any of that. She wasn't afraid of isolation. She wasn't afraid of, of protecting us from you know, a world that might take us away. She wasn't about that, and neither was my dad. So it was a very loving family, and I say that because growing up with that kind of love and security allowed me, I think, to think about God. And I've always thought about God ever since I was a little child. This is no kidding. I used to actually swing on a swing set and sing to Let It Be, the Beatles song, because there was something deep inside of me moving. My soul was moving, and I just wanted to know more. And that's why I say that I'm a Muslim by choice. I needed to be inclusive of everyone. And all of those prophets and messengers mattered to me. And Khadija, the powerful wife of Prophet Muhammad, mattered to me. And his beautiful daughter, Fatima, the saint, mattered to me. They had courage. They had voice. The Blessed Virgin Mother, oh, I could feel, I could just hug her. And I loved these courageous women that were also part of the narrative of the faith traditions that I had grown up in. But then there's something magical happened. And that magic actually happened in one of our traditions we call Hajj. And in Hajj, it kind of all came together. And I think Hajj has deeply influenced Zaman, which, by the way, is not a religious organization at all. It is a humanitarian organization but deeply spiritual. Its core values are dignity and, and love and openness and inclusiveness. 6,000 volunteers, 450 partners, 17 countries, and millions of people having been helped, especially single moms raising their children, abandoned, abused, divorced, widowed. We bring, we try to bring healing to that family. But what Hajj did for me was it kind of cemented that connectedness? So for Muslims, Hajj is kind of the return to the primordial self. It's the first sanctuary on earth created by Adam. And why that was so fabulous to me is because Adam and Eve and our tradition were created from the clay of this earth. And we are taught that God, when he created and fashioned Adam and Eve, he took from the earth the salty part and the sweet part of the earth, the clay, and the bitter, and, and, and all of these clays, and he fashioned them together, and that's why Mother Earth exists, was so that we can be created. And then after he fashioned Adam and Eve, he blew his beautiful spirit into us. And so going back to the first sanctuary on earth and then walking around this spiritual house of God that is a resemblance of the heaven, angels circumambulating up, up there and we down here, this kind of connectedness amongst millions of people, all different sizes, colors, shapes, different languages, that overwhelming global humanity made me realize this is way deeper than what I've been thinking about. I am responsible for you, and you are responsible for me. And that is the equation that creates the love and the connectedness. 
but that there's also this consciousness that of all the things created, God says of all the mountains majestic, the oceans deep, the one crowning creation, believe it or not, are you and I, because he imbued us with the spirit and he imbued us with choice, the choice to know him or not know him. And while this week isn't always about the God in the sky, it is about the spirit, and it is about something deep, and it's about connections, but that consciousness creates choice. And in that choice, there's power. So I also, in my early years, did open heart surgery and I do a tremendous amount of end of life work. And I can tell you that that human heart, the sanctuary that is capable of containing so much love and so much hate, this is fascinating to me. But I believe, I personally believe, because I've seen it across all cultures, all religions, when someone is taking that last breath or two, that domain, something magical is happening in and around that person. It's not something I can quite explain in words, but anyone who does end of life work knows what I'm talking about. There's a wisdom that comes into being and maybe a conscious or unconscious, or I'm not quite sure, surrender not in a bad way, in a very powerful way that allows us to move from one existence to the other. And so when I bow my head down to the ground, frontal lobe is where your consciousness is, it's when decisions are made. We as Muslims were actually paying honor not only to our Lord, but to the very earth we're created from. And when that earth splits and it houses my body, I am returning to the mother earth. The choice is to embrace it and to care for each other. And I don't mean this in a soft and fluffy way. I mean it in a concrete way. When you see an injustice, you fix it with your hands. If you can't fix it with your hands, you should speak out against it with your tongue. And if you can't speak out against it with your tongue, you must condemn it in your heart, and that is the weakest of the three. So there's a call to action to take care of each other, to really be one human family, because that ultimately was and is perhaps the divine plan. The test isn't in how much we can hurt each other. The challenge is in how much we can love each other. And that is really a choice. I thank you so much for your time. Bless you. Ouch. (laughs) Can't you be more comfortable in this chair? No, I'm good. Thank you. So you've touched on uh, the theme of certainly the festival but also today in particular, we have had, uh, spent the morning talking about love. Mm. And um, I just want to say that I, you know, to hear you tell the story of the gift that your parents gave to you with um, providing that love and security as a starting place is profound. And I guess I offer out there to the world a reminder of the power of love and our ability to um, practice love, to cultivate love, um, and that that informs this wor- outward work that we do, which you have so expressed in your, in your work. I'll let Sharon in. Well, I was certainly struck by that as well, and just the, because uh, whenever I hear or meet somebody who thinks, it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> I think they must have had a really happy childhood. Mm. You know, or at least that, I mean, obviously everyone has adversity or, or difficulty, but at least that core mm-hmm. of, of feeling loved and, and uh, being able to be themselves. So. I had a, um, a question about your organization, actually, as you began to talk about it. 
I wonder if there are any rituals or, you know, how do you maintain a culture that is um, where people are walking their talk, where you're working by and living by your values? Because I think that's, for me, that's a big question in the world right now. And so I just wonder if there's anything you do or any practices at the organization that you could share to help us understand how you really create a culture um, that lives its values. So a lot of what we do at Zimran is based on a transcultural model that teaches for nurses, that teaches you how to accommodate, negotiate, and repattern. Mm. And I keep that in my heart because I need to also sweep the floors, even though I'm the CEO. I need to get my hands in the work. Mm. And I think when it's as simple as when leaders are willing to be servants very much what Stephen Covey has always said, servant leadership. I really don't want the man to serve me, although it's giving me so much love. Mm. I really want to serve it, and I want to serve the clients and the volunteers who come from all around the country, by the way. It's, a, it's an amazing place. You walk into the, the, the door, and it, it just loves you. And, and <laughs> I think that's because we respect that poverty is um, not a station in life and that a person who's maybe taken a beating or who has suffered the loss of their partner or whatever it is and they have children that we can, we can unblock those clogged arteries of pain. That's what we do and we bring hope to humanity, but we don't define what that hope is. And I think that style of um, the culture that we're building at Zaman um, speaks to everybody, no matter what your station in life is. I think, I hope. Yeah, and I would also say, in my experience, it comes from leadership. So <laughs> you, what you embody you know, certainly has an effect, I'm sure, on the culture as a whole. Thank you. Oh, so. <laughs> mm -hmm.